Glad that you're still here with us on Morning Express on this wonderful 14th day of July 2015. It's time for Lifestyle. And on Tuesdays, we normally look at your health. We care about your health. Yes, we do. And today, well, we're going to be looking at some of the dangers that you may be putting yourself and your families into when you buy medicine off the counter. Now, what do I mean when I say buy medicine off the counter? I mean medicine that is not prescribed. I think um, as a culture, we sometimes self-medicate and get to a point where you find that you actually know all the medicines. I mean, I can tell you from experience, I know that when my boys were growing up, it got to a point where they have some recurrent things that come up like colds, sore throats, ear infections, and you almost know the script. So you know what medicine you're going to be prescribed for. So you get into the temptation of shortcutting, not going to the doctor, just go straight to the chemist and tell them, hey, this worked perfectly last time. Are there dangers in doing that? Well, that's what we're discussing. Remember, if you have any questions, we're going to be giving you an opportunity where you can call and ask your questions. You can also do that via Twitter, and the Twitter handle is at Michael G. Gitonga. Now, joining me in the studio uh, to have this conversation is Dr. Farzana Sundarji. I hope Hi. I pronounced that right. Yes, okay. thank you very much. And uh, also Dr. Shimona Menezes, who are pharmacists. Thank you, ladies, for joining us in the studio. And uh, raise the time, by the way, that I have more ladies than men. So <laughs> they must be, that's a good difference. Normally I have more men than ladies. So that's good. But anyway, are there dangers? Let me start with you, Dr. Fazana. And uh, are there dangers in buying medicine off the counter? Yes, there are dangers. Uh, there are a couple of dangers. One is underdosing. One is overdosing. When you buy medicines from pharmacies, Generally, you're, you're not too sure. They don't ask you the age of the patient. They don't know any other complications, whether the, the patient is, uh, you know, asthmatic, diabetic. So you might get a cough syrup, and all of a sudden that cough syrup has sugar. So what happens is the patient gets it, and their diabetes goes up because of the sugar. Um, the other uh, implications that you also have is that uh, you get uh, some people who misuse the drugs. You've got a pain in your leg or in your arm and you keep going for painkillers. You get the betadine with codeine kind of betafen painkiller. Mm -hmm. And so you keep taking the same painkillers all the time and you don't realize you're just masking the pain but you're not actually getting to the diagnosis of what the, the, the problem is. Mm -hmm. So in the end, you're not doing yourself any favors. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of complications. I'll let my colleague talk about the other couple. Mm -hmm. But I find that one is misuse of drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, you will go to the doctor all the time get the same thing and then you think oh he's got a cold I'll just give him it was perfect last time last time so yeah why wait in the queue for the doctor okay. why do I have to you know waste money for consultation I'll mm -hmm. just go straight to the pharmacy and get it but mm -hmm. in doing that you're not actually getting checked out by the doctor your vitals are not being checked when a pharmacy prescribes something they're not checking your vitals they're not checking your blood pressure or your temperature mm -hmm. they're not checking to see you know whether you have uh, urine uh, blood in the urine if you're vomiting, things like that, unless you tell, there's, there's no check they being do done. <coughs> All right, Dr. Shimona, d d should they do that? Should you have an, 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 an occasion where when you ask for medicine, they actually ask you for some details? Because most of what, what you'll find from experience mm -hmm. is that uh, if you tell them I need ABC, they yes. just go ahead and give you the ABC. Well, it's important to have diagnostic checks done mm -hmm. for, you know, any patient. I mean... As a pharmacist, you're trained to actually ask patients about their details, about age, weight, height, especially for children. You can't just give them an antibiotic and say, okay, take A, B, C, D, so-and-so dose and so-and-so frequency, mm -hmm. and they just take it and they'll be okay. Because mm -hmm. some of these medications are very strong, and you don't know what side effects. I mean, each patient has a different epidemi uh, epidemiology, like age, um, ethnicity so maybe this drug will work well on you today mm -hmm. and you give it to somebody else but mm -hmm. it won't work well on that person maybe they'll have a side effect mm -hmm. like diarrhea or vomiting yeah? so, so is that an issue of the pharmacists not doing what they're supposed to do are they supposed to demand that they do the test um, it depends on what kind of infection you know common infections like mm -hmm. if you go for the over over the counter medications if it's a common infection like just a normal flu or something. If you don't give antibiotics, but you just give like maybe for the fever and maybe an antihistamine like cetirizine for the patient, that should be okay. But if it comes to something like an antibiotic, there's a lot of resistance mm -hmm. right now, okay. like all over the world. It's not just in Africa or in Kenya. Mm -hmm. It's all over the world. So it's important to actually have lab 
the tests done right. so that they determine what sort of infection it is and mm. therefore with those lab tests they actually give you a list of medications mm. to which the microorganism is susceptible okay yes so mm -hmm. sorry yeah. I was just going to add you see what happens is when you keep going for recurring antibiotics mm -hmm. you get resistance to that antibiotic so you start with the first line antibiotic second line antibiotic third line because you go up what happens is without getting tests done, not checking what the infection is and you're just treating it, fine, at the time you're feeling great. But what happens is longer on in life, your body becomes resistant to, to that, that particular act. antibiotic. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So then, God forbid, you have a serious infection, mm -hmm. you'll find the first, second, third line antibiotic doesn't work anymore. So you're just building resistance in your body mm -hmm. to take more antibiotics and the stronger strength antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So why are we doing that to ourselves when we can actually try and deal with it and then take normal, exactly, mm -hmm. because you say at the moment everyone feels, oh, I've got a cold flu, I'll go to the pharmacy and get antibiotics. Mm -hmm. You're not doing yourself any favors. Have you had a blood test done? Have you mm -hmm. confirmed there's an infection mm -hmm. there? Coming long term up. you're actually working against your own body exactly okay now dr shimona now that we're talking about antibiotics one thing and i stand to be corrected is you'll find there's some doctors who are very quick to uh, administer antibiotics and sometimes especially in children uh, to avoid or to save you the trips to the hospital rather li like you've said starting with the first generation second generation third they give you a stronger one mm -hmm. just to ensure that uh, you know the infection is dealt with is that supposed to be the case um, no, it shouldn't be the case because if, um, say you start with amoxil, mm -hmm. the ideal antibiotic for any cold is amoxil, mm -hmm. but instead you decide to give augmentin, you don't know what you're fighting. It could be any infection, it could be pneumonia, maybe if it's a, you know, a, a cough which is persistent and has never gone away. Mm -hmm. Initially you treat for a viral infection. But at some point it goes to a bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. But if the cough is persistent, you start thinking, could it be something more serious? Could right. it be pneumonia? Could mm -hmm. it be TB? Mm -hmm. You know, so those are things that have to be looked at. That's why we tell patients often that please go get it checked. As much as we've treated the viral infection, mm -hmm. your cough is still persistent, which is a bit worrying. And of course, you ask them other symptoms, which then you start you know it starts making you think maybe there's something more to this right. so you don't advise them then please go to see a specialist okay so that at so, least so, so in a case uh, um, that a doctor yeah. gives you a very strong antibiotic mm -hmm. can you question honestly I think you can mm -hmm. it's your health mm -hmm. you are you're allowed to question the doctor it's your body after it's your all, body yeah. after mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel at the moment I find a lot of people are getting educated there's internet out there there was a time where you could not research things now you can go on the internet and it tells you things mm -hmm. so you are informed mm -hmm. so if you feel your doctor is giving you something mm -hmm. that you're not too sure of question it by all means because it's your right okay yeah all right um, uh, Dr. Shimona let's talk about there are the, the, the different kinds of medication mm -hmm. and you have those that treat short-term illnesses like the colds and coughs and all that you also have uh, okay. long-term medication uh, should this be treated differently Yes, definitely, because if it's an acute illness like, for example, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, you know, any just joint pain or something like that, you can take um, medication to treat that, which will just be for short term duration, so short duration, maybe three, five, three to five days. Mm -hmm. But if it's something which is chronic like diabetes and um, hypertension or a patient who's undergoing chemotherapy or anti-TB medication, all those need to undergo um, reviews at every time like for example if it's TB medication um, it's usually a six month duration right. but you don't just give the patient everything and say okay continue taking it they have to be reviewed there has to be a continuous rapport with the patient to find out if they're doing well are they taking the medications well is there compliance um, also they do the diagnostic tests mm -hmm. so definitely I'd feel for chronic conditions you have to have a constant review with the doctor. Okay. Yeah. And uh, should one demand, uh, uh, Dr. Fazana, uh, uh, a review from the doctor because you'll find with a chronic illness, let's take for instance diabetes, which cannot be cured per se, yeah. but can be managed. Yeah. There are certain medicines that may be prescribed and they work for you. Yeah. Uh, and over a period of time, you almost know the script. You know when you're doing well, when you're not doing well. How often should one be reviewed to ensure that the medicine maybe has not changed? Technology changes, medicine changes, your body also changes. And at some point, you may find that uh, you need different kind of medicine. So how frequent should one have the I review? I would generally say six months if it's stable. If it's a condition that's a new diagnosis, 
than three months, between two to three months. But if it's something that you've had long term, then every six months, in a year, you're just getting checked out twice, which I think would just make sure that everything is okay. Sometimes you find you take medication, and because you're taking it, it's putting pressure on your kidneys. Obviously, everything has a side effect. When you do that, you don't realize that you're putting pressure on your kidneys. So you're taking it, but if you're not being reviewed, no one's checking to see the state of your kidney or your liver. Right. So that's why it's important not only for that disease state, but to prevent other complications arising, which is why we say keep reviewing every six months mm -hmm. to a year with your doctor if it's a stable condition. That way the doctor knows if anything is changing. Okay. Yeah? Uh, should, should the pharmacist demand that there's a review? Are they going against the code of uh, conduct, for example? Controversy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very difficult question. Controversy. Um, no, but, but you know, no. it's somebody's health. And really, yeah. uh, since a, a, a patient has come to you and asked for medicine, should you administer it simply because you want to make a sale? Um, advisably, um, it would be better if the patient goes, especially when you know it's a chronic condition. Because um, nowadays you find a lot of patients are taking a lot of medications. Someone could be on hypertensive and anti-diabetic medication. So it's a whole combination of medications. And supposing, like, most of the prescriptions that we receive come for about three months to six months. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask the patient, when is your next review? When are you seeing the doctor? So sometimes they say, okay, I'm seeing the doctor in two weeks. So you know that probably the doctor just wants to reevaluate mm -hmm. to see if those medications are working, especially if it's a new medication. And, you know, especially like with diabetes, um, it keeps fluctuating. Mm. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So the doctor actually checks. So if the patient is an insulin-dependent patient, they're using insulin, the injection, they actually monitor. Mm -hmm. The patient does their tests at home. Mm -hmm. But that is recorded, and the doctor checks at the review. So advisable for certain patients, they do need a review when it's especially for new medication. Okay, but yeah. coming back to the question, yeah, should there, is there a code of conduct that pharmacists are supposed yeah. to follow? The pharmacists, if they're trained professionals, should know. There mm -hmm. are certain things that they should be alerted to. If mm -hmm. a patient comes and says, you know, my symptoms have changed, I'm getting weaknesses here, I'm diarrhea a little bit more, I'm having a urine retention, these are signs that a pharmacist should know something is wrong. You ask the history. Mm -hmm. A lot of pharmacists are supposed to ask a patient, how long have you had the symptoms? Are you taking other medication with it? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, have you uh, had any other symptoms added to it? From that, the pharmacist then should be able to make a, a decision. Is this something I can treat or is this something that needs further review? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, some people take it upon themselves to treat that person. Right. Yes? I have a, a very close friend of mine who um, was suffering with malaria. Went to the pharmacy. Pharmacist is one malaria uh, course didn't work. They went to another pharmacy, got another malaria course. In the long term, what happened was he started having kidney. His kidney was affected. Mm -hmm. And he actually had to have his kidney removed because of what happened. It was self-medicating without being treated. So we have problems like that where we, we, we have people who are treating without actually confirming the diagnosis. Right. So it's very important, important to get the diagnosis confirmed mm -hmm. and then treat the patient. Okay. Yeah? All right, let's talk about uh, addictive drugs because there are those drugs that can uh, potentially be addictive. Do, do the pharmacists have a way of telling that this is genuine? Again, because they will administer the medicine at request as opposed to prescription. Um, well, as far as addictive drugs are concerned, um, it depends. Like, for example, she gave you an example of betapin. It contains codeine. So definitely codeine cannot be given a very long period of time unless it's a chronic pain or a chronic illness that the patient is suffering from. Codeine is an addictive medication. Mm -hmm. Maximum they give you is for about five days just to relieve the pain. Beyond that, you definitely know there's something wrong. Yeah? If a patient keeps coming and saying, oh, please give me better pain, because it has those effects. Mm -hmm. Of course, it causes, the medication does cause drowsiness and everything, gives you like sleep. Okay? But at the same time, codeine has its own side effects. It can affect your liver and several other things and which you don't want. So definitely if a patient comes after five days and says, oh, I'm not feeling relieved by this pain. I need more medication. This is something that should be prescribed by a doctor, ideally, because of its addictive effect. Or, for example, there's a medication called amitriptyline. It's used for chronic pain. can be used for, like, it's mainly for the nerves. Now, some patients do abuse that medication. Okay, 
um, I've seen like sometimes in a chemist, they will just come up to you and say, they show you the box, this is amitriptyline, I've been using it, please give me a hundred tablets. You cannot sell that over the counter. Mm -hmm. It's not Or rather, you should not sell you that. You should over. not because it's a control yeah. medication. Well, question, okay, why are you using this? What mm -hmm. is it for? Mm -hmm. um, have you had any side effects? Has your doctor prescribed this? Is it for chronic purpose? So if they don't give you, you can tell from a patient's psychology, the way they behave with you, eye contact and things like that, you will know there's something wrong, definitely. Okay, so yeah. of course this begs the question, do we have registered pharmacies that will mm. ask these questions? Because at the end of the day, it is a business they're running, and there are those who really are <coughs> after the sale, they are not interested in the you question. You see, I think it's, it's very different in Kenya, because you have uh, pharmacists and you have farm techs. There's a difference. A pharmacist is a registered person with a bachelor's degree who's been to university, who's done an internship, who's registered with the Pharmacy and Poisons mm. Board. A farm tech, again, is done part of that course, three-year course. They've done an internship, but they're not very knowledgeable when it comes to the drug interaction. They're not trained to look at the pharmacokinetics and pharma, uh, dynamics of the drug, mm. how it works, the pharmacology of it. So they're just more into the dispensing process. So that's why when you have a pharmacist giving you, uh, you know, uh, advice, they're more looking at the whole, the whole round approach because they've been trained that way to look at how the drug works, how the drug works in the body, the how the side effects are. Yeah. Whereas when a farm tech does it, it, it's different the way they look at it. Not that there's a difference, it comes with experience and farm techs pick up with experience. But I find sometimes we have a lot of pharmacies that are run with farm techs and not pharmacists. Mm -hmm. So that quality aspect is missing. You know, mm -hmm. that, that extra care that you would get mm -hmm. is missing a little bit. Mm -hmm. But that's changing. We're, we're coming up in Kenya where I did my degree abroad. And abroad, if you're not a pharmacist, you cannot work. Even if a pharmacist leaves for lunch, you cannot give you out any sell. medicine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very strict. Is that the case here in Kenya? No. Here mm -hmm. in Kenya, no. So long as you have a pharmacist that's registered for that property mm -hmm. as a that's superintendent, mm -hmm. then that's when you can... Um, uh, give out you can run the, the, exactly, the, run, okay. the business. run the business. So yes, yeah. it is commercial. It okay. is very commercial. And is there a way for my own protection that I can tell or demand uh, for a pharmacist? Because at the end of the day, the farm tech is just administering what I ask for. Mm -hmm. They may not have, like you said, have the, the history and uh, the workings of that particular drug. Is there a way that I can know this is a pharmacist or a farm tech? Mm, actually, or demand for it. It is a very controversial, controversial question. Yeah, you can't and, uh, know. It's controversial. It's very difficult to ask at the moment. Things are changing. Let me yeah. say it that way. Mm -hmm. The way our pharmacy and poison birds is work working, our health uh, ministry is working, things are changing mm -hmm. and we will see changes. They're working for the better mm -hmm. to, to get these legislations in places. It'll take time. Mm -hmm. But for now, my advice to the viewers would be was if you go to a pharmacy, one, choose a regular pharmacy. One that knows you're coming in every so often, they know your history. They know you're diabetic or asthmatic or this. So they know your chronic medications, they know what else you take, they know your family history. Mm -hmm. You might not be diabetic, but your grandmother might be diabetic. And without realizing it, you might start having symptoms that mimics diabetes. Right. But unless you go to that regular pharmacist and have that interaction, mm -hmm. that's the only way they'll know. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, <coughs> the other thing was, if they know that your history, then they will be able to treat you better and they'll be able to advise you. So you build that rapport. What a lot of people do is, I'll go here because it's cheaper here, or mm -hmm. I'll go there because it's cheaper convenient, there. Convenient, it's closer. It's convenient, yeah. closer, whatever the reasons <coughs> are. When that happens, the, the, each person doesn't know what's going on. So your treatment is not being based fairly. So my advice would be, if you can pick <laughs> one chemist that becomes your local chemist that you go to, so that that person knows your history, mm -hmm. knows when you come in, oh, last time you got augmentin, you know, there was a cold, maybe this time it's a viral. You know, they will give you the right advice mm -hmm. rather than going to different places. Okay, sticking with addiction now on a family setup, is there a way of telling uh, that one of my family members is possibly drifting towards addiction to a certain drug? Because they could start innocently. Mm -hmm. Maybe, let's just take lack of sleep. They can't sleep, mm -hmm. so they mm -hmm. find a drug which, which works for their oh, sleep. Okay. Uh, is there a way of telling that they're actually drifting into addiction? You'd know from the side effects. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the way, like for smoking, if you or drinking, if you stop smoking. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're a chain smoker. You smoke, 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 smoke. Um, after a couple of months, somebody tells you stop smoking. So stopping the smoking, you find somebody trembles, somebody becomes change. irritable, or they get into like mood swings. 
So definitely even drugs, it's like smoking, Similar. it's tobacco, it's like a chemical, just like a medication. So even that, you will find people drifting off. Maybe there are mood swings, one day they're happy, next day they're like really angry or ag agitated, even getting into fights. So you definitely know there's something wrong. And you know that patient was pa probably your family was taking that medication. Yeah. But what you don't know is they've not stopped it. Maybe they're going behind your back. Like right. that's what addicts do. They go behind your back and yeah. find ways and means to get the medication. So just like any other drug, there's a change of behavior? Yes, behavioral okay. changes. Yes. All right. Clinical as well. Science. Clinical. Mm -hmm. You find maybe they're not feeling too well or, you know, things like that. They're constantly okay. sleeping, yeah. they're moody, yeah. they don't want to eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it's good to be observant. Yeah. All right, now, are there some medicines that you can self-medicate? Mm -hmm. Are there some that you're allowed to? I mean, for instance, uh, let's take an example of ladies uh, during <coughs> their menopause. Yeah. They, they yeah. have pains, aches all over, mm -hmm. and they have uh, a particular medicine that they Vastopan, take and it works. Right. Yeah, that, that is normal because that is a, a short, short duration. That's what yeah. we're saying. You can self-medicate on a short duration. duration. There's nothing wrong if you've got diarrhea. You know you need loperamide. Mm -hmm. There's no point. You've had something. You went out to eat last night. You know you've eaten something. You know it's going to be a 24-hour to 72-hour bug. So you can <coughs> go get some loperamide, which stops the diarrhea. Mm -hmm. That is suitable. You've got a cough and cold. You know it's the flu. It's cold at the moment. So you go to the pharmacy and you say, okay, I need something for my cough and cold. They'll mm -hmm. give you an anti-allergy, a cough syrup. But what we're saying is it's fine to self-medicate, but just make sure that you give them the history as well. Who it's for. Is it for a child? What your eight-year-old boy used, don't give it to your two-year-old son. Mm -hmm. Things like that are very important. Mm -hmm. The other thing would be to check with, um, to see uh, basically, is there any other symptoms? You know, you've given it for five days. Has it got any better? Has the patient felt any better? If the symptoms haven't got better in five days, then it's better to go to the doctor. So initially, yes, if you feel it's something that, you know, it's a headache, there's no point going to see a doctor for a headache. You know what you need for a headache. Mm -hmm. But if a headache persists for 10 days, something's wrong then self-prescribing for yourself for 10 days should tell you something is wrong I'll give you an example and it's, it's again my own father I wasn't here um, and he was taking headaches which has got aspirin he was having constant headaches and he was just whatever you say wakes up in the morning pops to headaches with a black cup of coffee mm -hmm. I get a phone call one day he's been rushed to hospital basically the aspirin he had an ulcer which no one knew because ulcers are very Subtle. Subtle. You, you mm -hmm. can't tell. Mm -hmm. But because he was taking the aspirin with black coffee on an empty <coughs> stomach, it started corroding at the ulcer. He had a GI bleed, so he was bleeding inside. Internally. Internally. Wow. And he had to be rushed in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So I'm just giving you my own family member's example. Mm -hmm. And that was because he kept going to the <coughs> chemist, buying the headaches, no one asking him any questions, no one wondering why is he buying headaches every day? Mm -hmm. You know, why is he... If someone had asked at that point, why are you buying? Mm -hmm. What is the problem? It then might have been arrested. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm trying to say. Um, with my own experience and being a pharmacist myself, that's what I realize people need to know out there. Mm -hmm. If people are not aware, then these are the things that happen. Yeah. Okay. So what's the general rule when it comes to self-medication? Uh, are we saying five days should be enough? Anything above that, then you need a doctor's intervention. Um, okay. I think, okay, for over-the-counter medication, like just for a general flu or something, um, just five days would be okay mm -hmm. if it's a viral infection. Mm -hmm. If it's something worse than that, um, it's advisable not to sell um, antibiotics over the counter. How, how do you tell though if it's worse? I mean, you, you see you, some of the symptoms you know. we, we present yeah. may be an underlying problem. Yeah. It just may be the, the top of what yeah. is really happening yeah. on the inside. Yeah. How does one tell the severity? Um, I guess if it becomes something which goes like, you know, sometimes, I mean, we all get flus, right? So mm -hmm. we know if it's more than like two days or one day, two days, three days, that it's just continuous, your nose is running, things like that. It gets worse day by day. Then definitely you know that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. You do have a flu, okay? But sometimes, uh, maybe if it's a gastric issue, these can manifest as other, side, as other symptoms in the body, yeah? You could maybe get breathing problems. So sometimes you feel, okay, am I asthmatic or mm -hmm. do I have like a chest infection? You don't know. The only so way you'd know vitals is are done. the vitals yeah. then should be done. Because mm -hmm. it could be a gastric issue, but you're treating 
a flu. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You've brought in an interesting um, um, complication that some people have, and that's asthma. And uh, you have uh, what's it called, the inhaler yeah. mm -hmm. that uh, people use, and sometimes it is there to be used in case, yeah. just mm -hmm. in case. Uh, but there are times it may go beyond its expiry period. Let's talk about expiry of drugs. How often should one check? Regularly. Mm -hmm. um, generally, when you get your batch of medication from any pharmacy, you should check the expiry. Mm -hmm. um, generally, they normally say when the shelf life of a drug is, say, June, it should be all right till the end of July. But they only put June on the packet, so you should just for just, that. Just for that, it's a late period. A window, a window. Opens a window, up. yes. Mm -hmm. But you should, you should check. Expired drugs generally tend to not give you any serious complaints. But you'll get the diarrhea. You'll get the, the side effects that you get from if you've eaten bad food mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So generally, you should check expired drugs. And while we're on the topic of expired drugs, I'd like to talk about people should be a bit aware about drugs that are not original counterfeit drugs. There's a big issue where we have drugs at the moment um, that are not coming from original suppliers. We get them in areas um, where no one's vetting them. And these, the government is doing what they can, but these come through back doors, obviously. So as, as viewers, we should actually check when we get our drugs, that are, the drugs that we're getting are original drugs. And mm -hmm. it's an important one for people to be, because you're on the ground. If you know you're getting the drug somewhere else at 100 bob and you're selling it at 20 bob, Alarm bells should arise that why is this guy selling in a 20 bucks? Why is it so cheap? Yeah. Why is it so cheap? Mm -hmm. And this is where we need the public to, to come together. Mm -hmm. and, and because if we don't know, mm -hmm. these things will happen. And counterfeit drugs can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not only in Kenya, it happens everywhere. Yes. And counterfeit, of course, is, is, is a risk. But sometimes you'll go to a pharmacy mm -hmm. and uh, they'll tell you we have a generic yes. as opposed to original. What's the difference between generic and original? Um. <laughs> Well, an original is like, uh, well, it's a lot of industrial in that, yeah. Jag jargon. Yeah. <laughs> so, an original is basically the company comes out with a molecule which is new, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's put onto the market. Now, a generic is when somebody mimics that medication. It's the same thing, but they add maybe a different uh, base or something mm -hmm. to the medication, but mm -hmm. it will do the same it's do the same work and treat the same condition. Does it do the same work or is it meant to do the same it work? Let me explain. What <laughs> it is is basically when you have a company obviously patents that. If, if I'm creating a new HIV drug, I put a lot of money into right. researching that drug. Mm -hmm. And you can call it Fazan <coughs> or something. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I've created that drug. So for a couple of years, no one else can make that drug. I get the patent rights to make that. So I'm the brand for that. And normally it's multinationals that will We'll do have that. the money to do the research to find right. a new drug. Mm -hmm. Then after that it gets opened up and then you get generics. So companies can produce the same thing with the same molecule and call it generics. The problem is generics are always cheaper than brands because brands have invested money into it so they are claiming their full price for it. Yeah. Whereby generics are cheaper priced because they're, they're, they haven't patented it, they haven't uh, done the research for it. Mm -hmm. So they're, But they come in about five to ten years after, after. the original drug has been in the market. Okay, risk versus no risk of generic and original? Mm. It depends where the generic is coming from. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the drug profile is important. Yeah. Mm. We, so I'll but be for me as a layman, really, I don't go into the details, but yeah, if I go to a pharmacy, not, yeah. they'll tell me this is original, yeah. it costs more, this is uh, uh, generic. generic, it costs less, so I'll and go for less. And, and, I'll, for less. and yeah. I'll be honest with you, a lot of the generics that come are vetted. Obviously, okay. when they're brought into this from a decent company, mm -hmm. uh, you have people that go out to visit the site at the country where it's been made. The Pharmacy and Poison Board have people that go there. Mm -hmm. They vet. Mm -hmm. They actually check mm -hmm. uh, to see that it, it, it's manufactured properly. We have dossiers. Mm -hmm. You check the profile. Mm -hmm. So they, they do check. We don't get this. We're talking about generics that maybe come through the back alley. Okay. Mm -hmm. But originally, if you go to most well-known chemists, mm -hmm. They it will have it. All right, final question, because we are out of time. Storage, how important is storage? Storage is very, very important. important. Mm -hmm. Where is it written on the packet? How do I know where to store? The I see some antibiotics you store in the fridge. Uh -huh. Others yeah. you yeah. don't. So how yeah. do I know the difference? You know, generally, if you're taking an antibiotic, they should tell you, it says it on the box. And generally, if they're putting it in a brown paper for you, the pharmacist should tell you, the pharmacist mm -hmm. should tell you how to store it, because it is important. If mm. you put cap uh, sorry capsules or tablets in the sunlight, with the sun, it's with yes. the degradation is going to happen. So yeah. the tablet's going to not work as well. Mm -hmm. You have some drugs that are slow-release drugs that are come in a capsule. Now, if you store them somewhere, all of a sudden the mechanism mm -hmm. of how it works in your body, it mm -hmm. doesn't work the same it way anymore. Okay. So it is important. As uh, viewers, they should ask 
when they're getting the medicine. Do I keep it here? Sometimes pharmacists forget to tell, farm techs forget to tell. So it's important that you as a, as a patient know where the to store it. The dangerous and know yes. where to store it. Yes. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Fazana and uh, Dr. Shimona for joining us this morning. And very educative, I must say. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very and much. for you at home, I'm sure you've got some information out of that. But remember, also on those medicines that you buy and you may have forgotten to ask, read the box. Read the box uh, on dosage and also where to store it, okay? So we'll wind up our health section right there. But don't go away. Still on lifestyle today, we're talking about talent search and one of the areas that uh, becomes very challenging in uh, searching for talent is in journalism so in case you're an aspiring journalist you don't want to miss out on this and for those of you uh, that are at home and are thinking well that's uh, an area I'd like to venture into please do stay with us right here as uh, we take a short break we'll be right back <laughs>